It was a rainy night, but it wasn't just the outside that was experiencing inclement weather. A storm was also brewing inside the palace. A chestnut-haired lady, out of desperation and fear from being kicked out of the palace, was kneeling in front of a blonde gentleman, begging him to marry her. The man, surprised though he was at her sudden proposal, stood, looking at her and said nothing. Wanting to persuade him, the chestnut-haired lady swore to be as meek as a rat in exchange for a three-year marriage, wherein she'll disappear right after. He asked her a reason for him to accept her proposal. Left with no other option, she brazenly told him she knew what he's hiding. Still left unconvinced, the man stared her down and asked to prove her claim. Wanting to persuade him, she laid her cards bare. Kneeling on one knee to meet her eyes, he accepted her proposal. That's how she got married to Aslan Thordal, but their marriage wasn't really welcomed by most of his fellow nobles. Some were amazed, shocked even. Others criticized the duke, Aslan Thordal, for having no taste in women despite having everything that a man could envy. The ladies whisper about her, the bride's humble origins and plainness, as they march onto the altar. However, the lady already knew what people were thinking of her, because she already read the original novel. She now lives inside that novel. She woke up one day as a ten-year-old with memories of the novels she read from her previous life. Believing it doesn't directly concern her current life, she ignored the memories. However, soon after, the events that will transpire in her life proved otherwise. It made her realize she's living a preordained life. Just like in the original novel, she became the Duchess of Thordal. It was when she was staring at their couple portrait that she reminisced the previous events that led to their marriage. At present, staring at the sunset by their terrace, she was surprised to find Duke Thordal, her husband, standing behind her and putting his coat on her shoulder. Together they watched the sunset on a chilly afternoon. She wished that their happy moments would last, even if theirs was just a contract marriage. These are her thoughts every morning, as she stared at their portraits hanging by the walls of their grand salon. It became a habit of her, as if it was reassuring her that she can have a future with him. But it isn't so. Just like in the novel, three years have passed and the inevitable came. The red-haired heroine of the novel, Rosalind Peridot, the woman who truly captured Aslan Thordal's heart was standing right before her. As soon as she saw her, Memories from the novel that she read from her past life came rushing in. Duke Thordal would do everything in his power to be with his one true love, Rosalind. She, the current wife, shall be replaced and nobody even cared to know what happened to her. She'll forever be known, just like in the novel, as the Duchess Thordal. Because she was an extra, with that last thought, she fainted. Waking up to her husband's worried expression, she realized she's in their bedroom. When he started to fuss and suggested for a doctor, she reasoned out her fainting as merely being surprised that the sudden arrival of Rosalind in their manner, convinced, her husband started to explain the young lady's situation. But the Duchess need not hear his explanation, she already knew her story. Rosalind Peridot was Duke Thordal's distant relative, orphaned at a young age and swamped with debt, she was about to be married off to any wealthy old nobleman who's willing to have her. Duke Thordal paid off all her debts and adopted her as his ward, providing all her needs and giving her a home by allowing her to stay in their manor. The Duke finished his explanation by stating that Rosalind will not be staying for long. He plans to properly introduce her to society and let her decide on a husband as soon as the season opens. All the Duchess did was give her consent. Rosalind and Aslan are bound to get close even if she tries to get in between them. Days passed and things in their home changed. What took her years and failed to accomplish, Rosalind achieved in two weeks' time. People regarded her as a lady of high caliber and is someone fit to be called as Lady of the Manor. Upon seeing her by the door of the Grand Salon, the warm atmosphere surrounding Rosalind shifted to something cold and distant. It was directed to the Duchess. Still, she tried to be cordial. Much to her surprise, Rosalind suddenly stood up and left her guests only to grab her by the arm and took her somewhere down the hall, far from the Grand Salon. She asked the Duchess if she's feeling okay. When the Duchess showed a puzzled expression, 
Rosalind inquired about the rumor she's been hearing that the Duchess was forced into marriage by Duke Thordal after kidnapping her and forcefully detaining her in his manner. Dread filled the Duchess as she remembered past events prior to their marriage. The kidnapping rumor was spread by none other her father. The Lairstein family was hell-bent on keeping her with them. Unable to bear her situation, she turned to the Duke for help. They staged a rumored detention and carried on with the marriage just to save her, besmirching his flawless reputation. Her nightmare with the Lairstein family all started when she was ten years old and was buying bread. Their carriage suddenly stopped in front of her and a lady, a countess, was calling her Helen like a mad woman. It was at that time that her memories of the novels she read from her past life started to actually feel real. The butler was stopping the madam and was telling her that Helen, her daughter, is already dead. But the countess won't listen. The count alighted the carriage and coaxed his wife to stop, only to be surprised and he, too, is calling her Helen. The Lairsteins left and it ended. But no, that night, she was kidnapped. The Count hired men to abduct her and gave her as a gift to his wife. She found herself in a luxurious household, dressed to the nines, and a lady was pampering her. Leela Violet, which was her real name, was no more. She is to live by the name of Helena Lairstein. As long as she plays the role of said dead daughter, she'll be treated properly. For years, though the Countess never heard her, she endured the horror of living by somebody else's name, with a crazy lady for a mother, all the while promising herself that she'll come back to her real parents when the madam dies. And so that day came, but the Count didn't let her go. The Countess bestowed Helen everything that she owns. Nobody can touch her inheritance until she comes of age. Enraged, the Count suggested to get rid of her. But the executor of wills informed him that included in the countess will in the event that helen perished before she comes of age all inheritance are to be donated to church desperate he locked her up in the manor's attic life was hard the maid started treating her worse than they treat the peasants but she finds comfort into knowing that with the death of the countess nobody called her with the name helen she can now live as leela even just to herself. But her life became a living nightmare at the arrival of the Count's mistress. Aside from being scorned by the woman, Glock, her son from another nobleman was constantly directing his sexual advances towards her. He is a good-looking man, with hair as white as snow and skin just as fair. However, his looks weren't enough to stop her from feeling disgusted every time he directed his sexual advances toward her. Her only solace, if anybody can call it that, was her occasional appearances at balls as mandatory proof of the Lairstein family to the solicitors that the Countess' sole heiress still lives. One night, as she was perfectly acting as a wallflower, she noticed a nobleman dropped his handkerchief, seeing that he isn't aware of it. She picked up the item and hastened after him as he was walking away. The man was tall, fair, and handsome, with hair as gold as the early rays of the sun. Never in her entire life had she seen someone with outstanding features. Said man was the young Duke Aslan Thordal. His name sounded familiar, but all she knew at that moment is that he was from a prominent family. In exchange for returning his most prized handkerchief, Duke Thordal asked her if there's anything she wanted to ask of him. She politely declined his offer. He gave her one of his cufflinks as a token of his gratitude. She can present the cufflink to his manor at any time, and she'll be granted access to anything she requests should she think of any in the future. Returning to the Count's manor, kept in the attic, she tried hard to recall Duke Thordal. Then suddenly she remembered... He was the main character of the novel she used to read from her past life. Contemplating on their encounter, the door of the attic opened and Glock entered. He started fondling her body. When she resisted, he threatened her about knowing her real identity. When it didn't work, he forcefully negotiated with her that he can find her parents if only she'll be good to him. For a moment, she let him fondle her, but disgust filled her. She grabbed a nearby brass candelabra hit him on his right temple. He immediately fell on the wooden floor, 
Unconscious and with a bloodied face, scared and lost, she grabbed the cufflink given by Duke Thordal and went out of the Count's manor. She battled the heavy downpour with only a thin indoor gown to cover her from the cold. Arriving at the Duke's property, she faced him as she stood soaked to the bone and flooding his expensive carpet. The Duke did not mind the mess and called for a servant to take care of her. Clothed in a warm dress that surprisingly fits her to a tee, she faced the Duke, and fell into a crumpled heap, kneeling just like what peasants do, she begged him to marry her. That rainy night led them to their contract marriage. Contrary to that night, the warm sunshine that touches her skin, as she sat in the wooden bench of their garden while she reminisced the past, somewhat consoled her. But the tranquil air was immediately shattered when she heard her husband and Rosalind talking about their contract marriage. It shattered her heart to hear her husband cite their marriage as nothing but a union of convenience, a merger without love involved. She knew from the start that romantic feelings were impossible between them, but she became hopeful. He was kind, sweet, considerate, and always come to her rescue when the other noble ladies belittle her flawed demeanor at parties, she misunderstood the good treatment he's been giving her. Knowing how Rosalind and Aslan would eventually end up together, just like in the novel, she fled from the scene and forced her heavy feet towards the manor, only to lose consciousness just before she can enter the front door. She became weak because of the abuse and stress she suffered from the Lairstein family. Her body failed to endure the emotional onslaught that morning at the garden. With hazy consciousness she saw someone by her bedside and mistook it for her maid name Jenna, because why would her husband be mindful of her when he already found his true love? Unbeknownst to the Duchess, it was indeed the Duke who was taking care of her at that time, worried for his wife's welfare, he gave orders to all servants to steer clear of the Duchess room. She didn't see how bothered he was that she's sick, and how he prayed for her to get well soon as he stayed at her bedside while holding her hand. Meanwhile, Rosalind who was left behind by the Duke without even a brief word of goodbye, was asking Jenna if the Duke knew she wanted to visit the Duchess. The maid informed her that the Duke gave strict orders for everyone to avoid the Duchess room and the hall where it resides to give the lady of the house uninterrupted rest. Exasperated and disappointed, Rosalind treads the manor's halls as she haughty thoughts fill her mind. She's far more adored and loved by people, they even consider her more deserving as a lady of the house, a salon, have no use for a duchess who can't play the part well. A devious plan started to play on her mind as she stared at the couple's portrait. It won't be hard for her to covet the duchess seat. Days after, the duchess woke up, Jenna, her maid was there to assist her. As she was getting up, the maid told her that it was the duke who took care of her, and it was only that morning he left her side, he is with Rosalind, taking care of something. The two are definitely getting closer. When she asked for the date, the answer Jenna gave her made her realize it was her real birthday, not Helena Lairstein's but Leela Violet's, on that chilly sunset by the terrace. A salon, who already knows her predicament, promised to celebrate her birthday. Driving away the dread she felt upon hearing that Rosalind and Aslan were together, she felt hopeful. Aslan always kept his promises. She asked Jenna to help her dress up. Dolled up, she excitedly rushed to look outside her bedroom window when she heard the carriage arrive by the front door, only to see her husband escorting Rosalind as she alighted. In her eyes they looked perfect together, just in the novel. Unable to bear the sight any longer, she walked away from the window and sat by her dresser, waiting the butler's announcement of that evening's itinerary. And so, it came, the Duke will be having dinner with Rosalind. With a sinking heart, the Duchess acceded and told the butler, before dismissing him, to tell her husband that she's fine. Feeling stuffy inside her room, she encountered Rosalind in the hallway. The young lady was ecstatic because the Duke is about to gift her a dress as thanks for accompanying him to a ball last night. A sinking feeling filled the Duchess' heart. The scenes of the novel are taking shape as it should be. There would be no place for the extra anymore. Following that train of thought, she decided that it's finally time to say goodbye and end their contract marriage. 
What she didn't know was her husband was already getting impatient and was extracting in a stern manner the information he's been waiting for Rosalind to disclose to him. That afternoon, the Duchess requested an audience with her husband. She finally said goodbye, but the Duke told her to wait until he comes back. In a rush, he left her without even a vague explanation as to why Rosalind is with him, with only a runner as companion. While the Duke was away, the Duchess decided to leave. Jenna, her maid and Dalton, the butler were doing their best to make her stay, but she already made up her mind. Wearing the plainest clothes, she packed the same kind of clothing in a small suitcase and left everything Aslan gave her. She left her wedding ring, along with a letter of goodbye and their contract. Unbeknownst to her Aslan was tracking down Glock. After their marriage, Aslan eradicated the Lairstein family who was trying to get their clutches on the railroad business owned by the Thordal family. When Count Lairstein died, Marissa, his mistress and her son, Glock, fled. For three years, he pursued them. His information gatherers led him to the estate of Baron Peridot who took Marissa as his mistress. He lost all his fortune after she lured him into gambling. Crazed, he killed her then committed suicide shortly after. Glock fled from their estate. Their leads led them after sniffing out a rumor. Glock was in a relationship with the only daughter of the Peridot family, Rosalind. Paying all of her debts, adopting her as his ward, it will surely lure Glock out of his hiding, that was his reason for bringing her into his manor. Meanwhile, as dusk was approaching, the Duchess reached a load. It is the place where her family fled into, for fear that it might cause trouble for the Duke should someone connect her real identity to the Violet family. Hearing her name, Leela, being called by her mother, she's finally home. That evening, the whole Thordal Manor was in chaos. The Duke was in a sour mood because Glock escaped, and went sour still, when he discovered his wife has left, giving one order after the other, he expedited the search for Glock and deployed the dukedom's knights to guard his wife. After giving instructions to his butler to procure the necessary preparations for his own trip to Elode, the duke went to his room. Rereading his wife's farewell letter, it sounded as if she misunderstood that he plans to marry Rosalind, exasperated. He pulled out an elaborate box from his pocket, it contained the intricately designed engagement ring he planned to give her that day, as a birthday present, to end their contract marriage and mark the start of a real relationship with her. He landed his eyes on the contract which she signed, he ripped it with vehemence. From the very start he never planned to end his marriage with his wife. Four years ago, before he even met her, He's been having dreams of a brown-haired petite lady. In the dream, he is older than his current self. The lady forced him into three years of contract marriage by blackmailing him about his secret. Said lady left him after the agreed time of divorce and was never heard of again, leaving him with a broken heart. He died alone, filled with loneliness and regret. Waking up, he felt ridiculous for getting affected with such a dream. Is it what they call a precognitive dream? Duke Aslan Thordal doesn't believe in such nonsense. Nevertheless, he wanted to understand what the dream was all about. Using the lady's features, he moved his informants. After months of searching, they found her. Her name was Helena Lairstein, a young lady seldom seen at balls, often indoors due to poor constitution. Out of curiosity, he instigated their encounter. He deliberately dropped his handkerchief within her line of sight. As he expected, she picked up his handkerchief and called his attention. What he wasn't expecting was his reaction when he saw her up close. He fell in love with her at first sight. Knowing she does exist, he obsessed over the dream, bought the dresses he saw her wore in the dream, even the mentioned scents, he bought all of them as he waited for her to finally visit his manor. That night as she begged him to marry her, and he asked her for a reason why he should accept her proposal. He was already expecting a blackmail from Helena Lairstein, similar to what she did in his dreams. But it never came. Even when she did mention his secret, 
She never actually said what secret was it. She pleaded in later cards bare instead. She honestly admitted she's not the real Helena Leerstein and the Count was detaining her in his manner until she's of age to claim his late wife's riches and properties left under her name as Helena. Amazement and relief flooded his face. The Helena that he loved and hated in his dreams was not the same in real life. She didn't resort to blackmail, rather she trusted him with her plight. Seeing how the him from the dream died of loneliness, his anger getting a hold of his emotions and betraying his wife and letting her leave, he swore not to make the same mistake. From the very beginning he planned a relationship where they just love each other without any hatred or misunderstanding. Morning came, the maids of Thordal Manor are abuzz with preparations for their master's trip, Rosalind. Hearing the news about the Duchess' departure felt even more confident than ever. With the Duchess out of the picture, it would be easier for her to make the Duke realize who it is that he truly loves. However, things won't go as she planned. For as soon as she voiced out her intention to come with him, the Duke brushed her off and instructed his butler to escort her back inside. Meanwhile at the Violets, Leela is having a warm moment with her parents while sharing home-cooked meals prepared by their parents, her brother, Aiden, even teased her about the Duke, that his actions seem like not just out of kindness, hinting that there's a much deeper meaning to it. Remembering the Duke sent stabbing sensations in her heart, She's certain that they are already getting much closer, since she's out of the picture. At the Duke's manor, left by her lonesome, with just maids to keep her company, Rosalind was rebelling, annoyed that she was left behind. She ordered the maid to set an appointment with the dressmaker. That night, she procured a new dress which she believed will be appealing for Aslan's eyes. Wearing the dress, she trod the way back to the Duke's manor, humming a happy tune, she even twirled to test the feel of the dress, when all of a sudden, a man grabbed her and swiped her against a wall. It was Glock. Rage filled her as she saw the man who abandoned her, after her father died and she was sold. Seeing that he can't approach her normally, Glock reminded her that he knew of her secret and reveal it any time. Dread filled her and made her unable to move. She met Glock two years ago, one usually boring day. It was her first time seeing a handsome man with unusual features and silver tongue. She immediately fell for him and shared an intimate relationship with him. Unfortunately, those intimacies got her pregnant. All that Glock did was told her to wait. But waiting was all that happened, for when her father got bankrupt and committed suicide, she had a miscarriage because of shock. Glock ran away and abandoned her, as she was being sold. It is then she met Aslan Thordal, a young handsome and wealthy duke, who paid her debts. His wife is a sickly lady who seemed to have a not-so-good relationship among the noble ladies. She coveted her spot from the start, thinking that she's easy prey. Back to present, Rosalind slapped Glock after he mocked and threatened her. She ran in an instant when she saw the stunned look on his face. Reaching the Duke's manor, her dread only increased. The Duke might really turn away from her in disgust if her discover her secret. Meanwhile, the Duke has reached his wife's current location and was about to knock when he saw her by the open window, radiantly smiling and beautiful as ever. It was the first time he saw her looking so happy. It made him question his right to bring her back with him at the Thordal Manor where she never looked happy and always looking insecure. Her brother Aiden went out of the front door of their home, Followed by his wife in her casual clothes, without even a wrap or a cloak, the morning was chilly, but the siblings went on harvesting herbs as if it was summer. A slan Thordal hid behind a tree and continued to observe. As she was picking herbs, Leela unintentionally thought of a slan. He is probably being intimate with Rosalind at the moment. Unable to bear the pain, she shook her head and looked away, only to see a man's silhouette, Leela thought it was her husband, Aslan, only to get momentarily disappointed to find out that it wasn't. It was a man called Hans, who was a local postman who delivers daily newspaper. Mesmerized by her, Aiden, her brother, reminded Hans not to covet his sister because she is already married. Leela corrected her brother and said she's already divorced. Aslan, who was covertly listening, felt sad for his wife. 
She must have really suffered when she was still with him, forced to live under a name that isn't hers and be in a contract marriage for three years, who would be happy? When his wife was summoned by her mother inside, because she's been out in the cold for far too long, the Duke decided to leave and head back to his manor. He left the dukedom's knights to guard his wife and to report immediately of any happenings from her home. In the Duke's manor, Rosalind was waiting for Aslan to come back. When a maid announced his arrival and that the Duchess wasn't with him, she rushed out of her room and welcomed him sweetly, not minding the sour mood he's under. Out of excitement, Rosalind made a slip, unfortunately for her, the Duke caught ear of it. Summoning the servants who were directly serving under his wife, the Duke clarified things. The dress was her request, and not as a gift from the Duke, as she told the Duchess. The dinner with Rosalind that transpired, on Leela's birthday, was because she told the Duke that his wife made excuses that she's not feeling well and wanted to rest by herself in her room. It dawned on him. It was his fault for not keeping Rosalind in check. Infuriated with Rosalind, he instructed his butler to extricate her from the manor and transfer her immediately to another house. If Glock attempts to contact her, he must be captured at all cost and brought to him. As soon as Glock is captured, Rosalind is to be banished and never be allowed near him or his wife ever again. As Rosalind was being taken away, a letter from the Elode house arrived. Mr. Violet was seen rushing to town to buy cold medicine. Leela got sick for going out in the cold of the morning. Worried for his wife's welfare, the Duke went to Gaga. He summoned the doctor and instead of sending him off by himself, he decided to accompany him. His apprehensive state allowed his enemies to see an opening and sent for an assailant. In a rush to board a train with the doctor, he didn't bring an escort and was in a hurry crossing the street that he failed to notice the rushing carriage meant to run him over, despite the doctor's warning. The Duke badly injured his head and was unconscious. While out of sorts, Aslan dreamt about a brown-haired petite woman. She was able to blackmail him into marriage by telling him she knew his secret. Said secret was his cover-up of his mother's crime. She killed his father, and he made it appear like an accident. Soon right after, he sent his mother at a monastery to avoid trial. He married the woman and stayed married to her for three years. She left with no qualms. When he woke up his servants were showing anxious expressions, seems like his head injury caused amnesia, and he can't remember all the things that transpired right after he turned 20. When he woke up, he immediately inspected the couple paintings hanging by the walls of his manor. He still can't believe that he married the woman, who looks exactly like the woman in his dream who threatened him.